it literally does not benefit the United States for there to be a racial wealth gap. The only purpose that it actually serves is to maintain an illegitimate system of injustice in which one group of people dominate over the other. When it comes to reparations for the descendants of American slavery, the one thing that becomes painstakingly obvious is how utterly terrified the United States government is at the thought of paying out reparations in the form of cash payments. This is a fear that you see reflected by way of those like Sheila Jackson Lee and virtually the entire Congressional Black Caucus who supposedly are fighting for reparations, yet will be the first ones to downplay if not completely disregard reparations in the form of cash payments. Now the downplaying and disregard of cash payments in short are due to the fact that the United States government would not be able to control the outcome of what happens once cash payments are issued. But if it comes by way of merely governmental programs, well, those programs can be designed to fail and the American government will look at you and say, well, you got your reparations and you blew it. So buzz off. But interestingly enough, there's another group of people who are black that say that cash payments wouldn't solve the problems of the black community because we're too damaged of a people. Apparently, we're not intelligent enough of a people to be able to handle cash payments because all we do with it is buy more guns, more weed, more Jordans, and more weave. Black on black crime would go up as well as the out of wedlock birth rate. This is what people seriously tell me, and I've seen multiple videos of other black people spewing what are essentially white supremacist talking points. But here is what's interesting. There's actually studies that speak to the opposite of that, and studies that show that closing the racial wealth gap would actually be good for the United States versus being a burden. Now, on November of 2003, a paper was published by the Journal of the American Medical Association titled The Relationship Between Poverty and Psychopathology. Now, let me take a moment to read some of that paper to you. In the middle of an eight-year community-based study of the development of mental illness in children, we were confronted with a natural experiment in which income levels in an entire community were raised. We used this conjunction of longitudinal evaluation and natural experiment to test the effect of social causation on the trajectory of child and adolescent psychopathology. Now, I know some of you may be wondering what exactly is social causation, so I'll read the definition to you right now. The social causation hypothesis asserts that experiencing economic hardship increases the risk of subsequent mental illness. The selection drift hypothesis posits that mental illness can inhibit socioeconomic attainment and lead people to drift into the lower social class or never escape poverty. Now, what was the natural experiment that occurred in the middle of their eight-year study? You'll find it right here in the section titled Intervention. Beginning in 1996, tribal members began to receive income from a gambling casino that opened on the reservation. Under the terms of the agreement with the casino operators, every man, woman, and child receives a percentage of the profits paid every six months. Children's earnings are paid into a trust fund until the age of 18 years. The payment has increased each year, reaching around $6,000 by 2001. The opening of the casino also increased the number of jobs available in the casino itself or in the surrounding motels and restaurants. These jobs are available to both Indians and non-Indians, but Indians receive preference in hiring at the casino itself. Now, one of the members conducting this experiment, Dr. E. Jane Costello, testified at a 2014 oversight hearing called Early Childhood Development and Education in Indian Country, Building a Foundation for Academic Success. And in this hearing, she cited this study. Now, what I'm going to do is play you her testimony at the hearing, and it's a little lengthy, about six or so minutes long, but it's worth listening to due to the findings of this study now 20 years later in between the time the study began to the time of her testimony in 2014. Dr. Costello, you may proceed. Chairman Tester and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to testify today. Uh, I am a psychiatric epidemiologist, glad to explain that, and, and I am most grateful um, to you for your continued support of basic science, funded in this case through the National Institute of Mental Health, National Institute on Drug Abuse. However, the views that I express here are not necessarily those of the NIH or of Duke University, they are my own. So the research that I want to present to you today carries, I think, a very clear message. We pay now or we pay later. 
Uh, let me explain. Our tax dollars can support poor families uh, while their children are growing and developing, or we can pay the higher cost of obesity, alcohol and drug abuse, crime, and loss of economic productivity down the road. I'm not just saying this, let me tell you about the data. For 20 years, we at Duke have studied the same group of 1,400 people living in the mountains of Western North Carolina, of whom 350 are American Indians from the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. The children whom we began to study in the 1990s have now grown into their 30s and we're able to look at the long-term effects of investments in their health, education and welfare. In particular, we're able to examine the long-term effects of an important decision made by the tribe 20 years ago when they opened a new casino on the Koala Boundary, which is the, their home in North Carolina. Casino revenues were spent on tribal services in general, including behavioral health, drug abuse prevention, health care and education and social services. But in addition, every enrolled member of the tribe has each year received a proportion of the casino's profits for their own use and the use of their families. So did this extra money that the tribal families received, <clears throat> which was around $4,000 a year per person, did it have an effect on children's health and development? We could answer that question with some confidence because we could compare the children's emotional and behavioral problems before and after the income supplements began. We found that when families lived above the poverty line, their children had relatively few emotional or behavioral problems, and the added income made little difference. If families were so poor that even the income supplement did not raise them above the federal poverty line, their children had a lot of problems which continued even when the families received the additional income. However, for the group of families who hovered near poverty, the cash supplement that lifted them above the federal poverty line had a powerful effect in both the short and the longer term. In the years before the supplement, the children in these families had high levels of anxiety, depression, and conduct problems. Four years after the supplement began, levels were no higher than in <clears throat> children who were never poor. The details of this can be found in an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association, which I appended to my record. Um, we've now followed these children into their 30s, and with the aid of economists Randy Aki of UCLA and Amelia Simonova of Johns Hopkins University, we have shown that there are marked effects of this cash supplement on many areas of life particularly those who were the youngest when the supplement started. As adults, they use less alcohol and fewer drugs. They're less likely to commit minor crimes and more likely to graduate from high school. Teen pregnancies were less common, and the IQ of this group when measured at age 25 was a bit higher. Obesity, while unfortunately high in this part of North Carolina, increased less after the supplement was introduced. You may well think that investing $4,000 a year in a child or adolescent puts this sort of income supplement out of the question. So we've conducted a cost-benefit analysis that tracks the cost of the supplement over the years against the savings resulting from it. We found that the cost of the supplement exceeded the dollar value of the benefits for the first four years after which the value of the benefits relative to the costs steadily increased and soon substantially exceeded them to a total of some $20,000 by age 25. What these data tell me is that we pay now or we pay later. 20 years of research, I think, have made this result very clear. Could you could you give me a, uh, just I'll let you flesh this out a little more a, a little bit more about what you saw before and after the stipend when it came to early childhood uh, development? I have to make a couple of caveats. The study starts later in age. It didn't we didn't start the study till they were nine? Oh, okay. So so you'd want to do we want to do another study going back um, go. even earlier on, but. Um, 
The other thing I want to say is that we didn't go into this with funding to do this study. Okay. It emerged serendipitously out of a study of the development of emotional and behavioral problems, which included the, um, <clears throat> the Eastern Band of Cherokee, and they uh, did this thing of, yeah. um, of opening a casino and putting money into families, both into the community and into families. And what we saw was uh, over the looking at the difference um, between before and after, a significant fall in the number of emotional and behavioral problems. So, uh, <clears throat> conduct so, so, so like let, let me ask mm. you this, and you talked about the three mm. different groups, the, the mm. folks that were already above the poverty line, the folks that were hovering around the poverty line, a little below, mm -hmm. and the folks who were poor. Um, and I believe your testimony had talked about the folks above the poverty line did about the same after the stipend as before, and the mm -hmm. folks who were very poor did about the same uh, after, after the stipend. It was the folks that you got above the poverty line that really made a difference. Um, I would assume this includes everything, teen pregnancy, drug abuse, scholastic underachievement, the works? Uh, yes. It okay. Did. And did you see any rise at all? Uh, any improvement, should I say, at all, as far as the folks who were extremely poor? Yes, but people didn't stay in the same band, the same poverty band forever. And so, the, and the children of If those, they stayed in that poverty no, band, nothing improved? If they stayed in that poverty band, nothing shifted them. Okay. okay. And I think it's important, if I may interrupt you a moment, sure. to say that exactly the same patterns were seen in the white community that surrounds the the koala boundary because we studied so the, a thousand white kids too and so what i'm saying is this was a general pattern but because um we we couldn't ascribe cause to it in the white community because uh kids could have moved out of poverty because their families worked hard or something as, uh, how wide spreads the information you've got and what I'm asking is, is that are any of the if you if any of the agencies asked for it or if you offered to pass it along? Because it looks like, I mean, we've got a lot of programs out there. We're spending a lot of money on. Maybe we'll just give them a cash stipend. Yeah. Well, it's an option. Um. <laughs> <laughs> now, as you can clearly see per the study cash payments do not equate to falling into further debauchery or aberrant behavior. It actually has the opposite effect. Not only that, but the study also goes on to prove that over time, the early investments in cash payments now will actually have a positive outcome, economically speaking, in the future. Even in the McKinsey and Company report of 2019 titled The Economic Impact of Closing the Racial Wealth Gap, they reported that by closing the racial wealth gap, the US GDP could be four to six percent higher by 2028. It literally does not benefit the United States for there to be a racial wealth gap. The only purpose that it actually serves is to maintain an illegitimate system of injustice in which one group of people dominate over the other. So when you see members of the dominant society poo-pooing on reparations alongside with CBC members like Sheila Jackson Lee, who is controlled opposition, downplaying the need for cash payments is because they know it would actually work. Please do not let anybody sit up there and tell you that reparations by way of cash payments would not solve the problems of the black community because the issues that we face runs much deeper than what a check can fix. That is a lie. And stop letting your own people push these white supremacist talking points on you that we're just so goofy that if you even got reparations, all you do is spend it on Jordan's weed and weave. Those are white supremacist talking points. Now I've said this before and I'm going to say it again. The only justice that matters is economic justice. Anything outside of that is simply a waste of time. Once economic justice is realized or you're able to economically empower yourself, all these other issues fall to the wayside by default. 
But if you're following behind the Congressional Black Caucus and Sheila Jackson Lee, they'll serve you up a form of reparations that will have absolutely no effect on the black community. And if you keep following behind the Sean Kings and the Patrice Colors of the world, they'll have you chasing your tail, spending years fighting to reform criminal justice laws that were never going to affect the overwhelming majority of black Americans to begin with. Meanwhile, economically, we remain at the bottom while they're buying million dollar homes. Stop letting these people play games with you and waste your time. If you are not talking about economic justice, then you aren't talking about anything. And with all that being said, that does it for today's video. Thank you for listening. Make sure you hit the subscribe button as well as the bell notification next to the subscribe button so you can be notified whenever I release a new video. All social media links will be pinned in the comment section below. Please make sure you text TD Hip Hop to number 33222. That's TD Hip Hop to number 33222. That will get a direct text notification whenever I release a new video, but it also serves as a protection plan. So in case YouTube ever gives this channel the ax, I'll be able to send you a direct link to where you can find me next. Also, if you have a love and appreciation for the work that I put in on this channel the number one way you can show your support to me is through patreon for only three dollars a month that would help put me in position to be able to take td hip-hop media off of youtube remember the goal is not to grow big on youtube but to grow independent of youtube and lastly if you haven't already please make sure you join the emailing list there is no way that i can go independent of youtube if i cannot take the audience with me all links will be pinned in the comment section below and until the next video peace